Well, hey, good morning and welcome to Steeple Church Online. My name is Corey and it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you, whether you are a first time visitor to Steeple Church in this form or whether you've been with Steeple Church for quite some time and you call Steeple home, you are so welcome. We're so glad you could be with us this morning to join with us in worship, to engage in God's word together. Can I encourage us all this morning, regardless of how long you've been with Steeple Church, whether you're visiting or whether your Steeple Church is home, I want to encourage us this morning again to participate participate in every element of this morning's service. James 4 verse 8 says this, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. I want to encourage you this morning and remind you again that God is already here. He's already present. He wants to move. He wants to speak to you. He wants to encourage you. He wants to bring about transformation. But the call here in James 4 is to, hey, respond to God's already present and active presence in your life and our life as a church, wherever you might be. Church, I want to remind you again to request prayer if you need it. Someone will be waiting for you and and we see it as a real privilege to be able to engage with you and support you and serve you in that way. So click on that at any time throughout the service. Give the preacher, Pastor Dan, an amen by clicking the heart button when he makes an amazing point that really speaks to you. Hey, write some notes in the, in the chat box. If you're visiting with us, say hello. We'd love to say hello to you too and welcome you into the service this morning, into the family of God as we worship and engage with the Lord. Bless your church. Have a great morning. You'll see me as per usual throughout the service, but I wanted to just start off by blessing you. And let me pray as we begin the service. Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to engage with you in this way. God, I pray that as your word says, where two or three are gathered, you are very much in our midst. God, I pray that this morning, wherever people are at, whether they're gathering in their lounge room or their bedroom or wherever it is, God, in the dining room, Father, I pray that they would know that your presence and your power is with them. God, encourage us as we engage in worship, as we seek to glorify you and magnify you in this season and in this moment. God, speak to us as we enter into your word this morning, as Pastor Dan brings a phenomenal word. God, we come with open hearts and expectant hearts to be transformed, to look like and become a church that represents and demonstrates you so well in our community. Father, we give you praise. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, have a great morning. We'll see you soon. Bless you. Good morning, Steeple people, and welcome back to another week of Steeple Church Online. We're so excited that although we're not in one building, that we still get an opportunity to worship God together. Um, I just encourage you to lift your hands and engage however feels comfortable for you, um, and just declare the, the presence and position of God in your life as the cornerstone.
Good morning church, it's Jane here and I've got my beautiful daughters Charlie and Jemima wanting to, they're in at church here this morning. We hope you've woken up happy. Let, just wanted to let you know that this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in him. And I just um, want to encourage you to smile today. Whatever is going on in your world, know that um, Corey and I and our family are for you and praying for you and as well as um, Jesus is for you and he rejoices over you with singing each day it says in Zephaniah and this morning we're just going to take two minutes right now um, with whoever you're with if you're um, with family loved ones your housemates um, your children I just want to encourage you um, to pray for our neighbors that are around you that you have impact on um, your families, your friends. I want you to pray for our city of Victoria and Melbourne. And I want you to also pray for our nation's leaders. I feel really strongly at the moment to pray for our leaders of our country. Um, they're having to make some big decisions around how we operate and um, the stress they must be under must be quite phenomenal and I just want you to uplift them whatever your political beliefs are um, let's just pray for our country and that we move forward in how God wants us to move and so we're just going to take two minutes right now um, for you to reach out and pray and be bold be courageous I just want to encourage you to do that I'll see you back soon I hope you spoke boldly, church, and I'm just going to pray with you now boldly as we um, just close this segment of prayer and praise and move on into the service. Um, dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, I just thank you that you are a great God. Lord, I thank you that you are good. I thank you your mercies are new every day. And Lord, I just thank you that we can rejoice in you. We can thank you for whatever our situation is. And Lord, I just pray for... Um, our neighbours, I pray for our city and I pray for our nation's leaders, Lord, that you are surrounding them, that you are giving them wisdom, grace, and uh, you're just holding them up, Lord Jesus, right now, that they can do the right choices, that they feel encouraged and supported. Um, and Lord, I just want to pray for our church. I thank you for Steeple Church and all its members. Lord, I pray that you're helping everyone to smile today and be encouraged. In Jesus' wonderful name, I pray. Amen. It's great to see you, church. Talk soon. Well, hey guys, it's me again. Just thought I'd uh, jump in and give us a really, really brief update again on what's happening 
in the life of our church. A couple of really small things in one sense, but a couple of really big things in the life of our church. Uh, I mentioned last week that we started connect groups. Well, let me tell you something. We've started two more. Just this week, we've actually started two seniors connect groups and they've gone super well based on all reports from Pastor Andrew. Great job, Pastor Andrew. I want to thank you for putting that together. So two more seniors connect groups. Guys, we continue to contribute to our friends uh, at Servants Community Housing. This week, we delivered uh, another 30 packages just to Servants Community Housing. And then we've had a number of other people uh, contribute and also jump on board and order packs for themselves. Guys, it is going strong. Continue to support that initiative uh, through Steeple Church. I also want to encourage you that not a week goes by where we're not getting feedback from people who are jumping online and actually watching and participating in our services each week. People that uh, have not walked through the front doors of our church service are actual in the flesh kind of church service where people are jumping online and uh, I'm getting messages and other people in our team are actually getting messages from people, random people who are actually jumping online and being blessed by our worship, by the word that is being brought and by just our little updates and the way that we're getting involved in the community. So guys, I want to encourage you, invite your friends to watch Steeple Church online with you. Invite people who don't know Jesus at this point. Um, there are people who are watching our services online who don't know Jesus, but who are being encouraged, who are being blessed and who are actually moving in my view, closer to a relationship with Jesus. So keep praying for salvation. Keep praying that people would engage and encounter the living God that we love and worship every single Sunday when we get together and in and through our lives as we go and be the church beyond the four walls of the actual building and beyond the web service that we're actually providing in this way. Church, bless you. Keep being you. Keep being powerful. Keep believing that Jesus is at work and moving in and through your life and in through us as a church. You're amazing. I love you all. Bless you. We'll see you soon. Um, hello, it's Steeple's Espresso Cafe. On behalf of servants in Romana House, we'd like to thank you for the hamper you gave us all, um, especially when times are so bad. You know, we love the fruit and the munchies, and I'm a bit of a Christian. I like the Bible verse and Psalms. So, yeah, thank you very much from, uh, from all of us. Thank you. Well, it's great to be with you this morning as part of Steeple Church. I am Pastor Andrew and it is my privilege to share a few brief thoughts around communion. The night in which Jesus was betrayed in the upper room, the Bible says this in Luke 22. When it was time, he sat down, all the apostles with him and said, you have no idea how much I have looked forward to eating this Passover meal with you before I enter my time of suffering. It's the last one I'll eat until all we all eat together in the kingdom of God. In the subversive, subversive and, and dangerous context of the upper room, Jesus shares and teaches. He reveals to his disciples that the Passover is really about him. And Jesus had already been threatened with death on a number of occasions. It was, it was hazardous times. What Jesus shared, taught and declared that night is still dangerous. Why? Because we're declaring by taking this, this bread and this cup that Jesus is our only salvation, our only eternal hope. Jesus declares this salvation to be totally exclusive and totally inclusive. Exclusive because our salvation, our hope is found in no one else but Jesus. And inclusive because anyone, anyone, can come to Jesus. Jesus' love for us is unquestionable, unquenchable, and unfathomable. Dan shared with us last week a verse from Acts 4.12, and it says this, Salvation comes no other way, no other name has been given or will be given to us by which we can be saved, only this one. Hmm. And it's Jesus. Pray with me, please. Father, thank you that you sent Jesus into the world to deal with the barrier of our sin. We rejoice that through your love, Jesus met this need by taking our place on the cross. We thank you that we have the reminders through this bread and cup of your incredible grace. In Jesus' name, amen. As we uh, take the bread, it reminds us that Jesus physically came. So take whatever whatever you've got in your hand, you, you use that. Thank you.
But we know that Jesus did far more than just live amongst humanity. As we take the cup, it reminds us that Jesus physically came to earth, but he also died in our place. He dealt with the issue of sin. The barrier between us and God has been destroyed for all time. Take the cup. So as we continue to be part of today's service and throughout this week, may each of us be refreshed by his spirit, knowing and experiencing his love. Blessings to you all. Hey everybody, as we come around our time of tithes and offerings, I just wanted to encourage everyone with a quick thought. I was thinking about it and what does it take to be a generous giver? It's not as simple as having something and giving it to someone else. Uh, and it's not as simple as coming to church every week and just giving 10% of our income because that's not the heart of being a generous giver. That's a bit of a framework and yes, that's what we do. It's not a problem, but there's so much more to it. And it's what Jesus started to speak about. This is what you can do, but when you understand what I've given you, this is what you can do. Uh, and this is the resource that I've given you. And so to break it down really quickly, the first thing, there are three things. The first thing is uh, a decision. A decision that says, should an opportunity come up, I am gonna be generous about my response and I'm gonna be generous with my time and the love that I have so much of uh, and my smiles and the way that I serve and all of that, I'm gonna do it and I'm gonna give it generously because I know that God has already given so generously to me. The second thing is opportunity. There's no use making a decision to be generous and then keeping it to yourself and having your head buried in the sand, not being able to share your, your generosity and your giving with other people. And so you need to have an opportunity to do that. And so I just pray and I hope that once you've made the decision, your eyes will be open and your heart will be open and you'll be in tune with the people around you and within the community and within your culture so that you can identify needs and look at them as opportunities to be generous and to give whatever the situation, whatever the need is uh, in that circumstance. And the third thing that we need is resource. And we know that resource comes from God. Absolutely everything. We've been blessed abundantly with the love, the grace and compassion. Everything that we need from God um, is not only given to us for what we need, but it's given to us abundantly more than we need so that we can actually give it away, so that it can benefit others. <clears throat> God's resource is not just for us. If it was just for us, it would be really self-centered. Um, and the whole Christian movement would be about me, but it's not. It's about your next door neighbor. It's about the lonely girl across the road. It's about the quiet colleague at work um, who keeps to themselves. It's about our ability and our opportunity to impact them in a really positive way by being generous with the way we approach each and every opportunity with them. And when we come back to resource, um, it says in 2 Corinthians 9, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good works. Now, if we know that and we have that understanding that God is with us and he is giving us everything that we need, once we've made the decision to be generous, um, once we identify an opportunity, we can know and trust that God is going to bless us and give us everything that we need to perform those good works and exactly what that looks like. Talking about decisions and opportunities um, and resources, you can give. Um, even while we're in isolation, there are three different ways to give. You can give via direct debit. You can also give via uh, steeplechurch.com.au forward slash give. And in the chat, there will also be a give button popping up very, very shortly. Enjoy the rest of your morning.
Good morning, Seaple Church. It's Daniel here. So glad to be with you again to continue our series in the book of Acts. You know, whether you're a visitor or a member of Seaple Church, I'm so glad we can use this online platform to actually study and apply the Word of God together. We're going to continue in the second part of Acts 4, but a bit of a recap. Two weeks ago, we, we learned the story of Peter and John at the temple, where they encounter a man who's lame and he's a beggar, and they declare healing over him in the name of Jesus. And following that, they cause a bit of a scene by preaching and teaching about Jesus in the temple, and the Jewish leaders don't like that. They end up bringing them in for questioning and ask, in whose name do you do this? And they declare it's in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Eventually, they're thrown in jail overnight, and they're brought again in front of the Jewish leaders. And we see that Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit and he has a, a bit of a, a dialogue with them. And they're astonished that God is using unschooled, ordinary men like Peter and John. And that's where we finished last week. We're going to pick up today from Acts 4, 13 to 21. And when you read this, I want you to look at this through the lens of response. What are the responses that we see from Peter and John? What are the responses we see from the Jewish leaders? Verse 13 in the NIV version. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then confer together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. They then called in again, them in again and commanded them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. In the story of healing from chapter 3 to chapter 4, verse 21, I want to contrast the two different responses. They're going to encourage us in our, in our journey of sharing our faith. The first one is that of the Jewish leaders. You'll notice here that in verse 16 to 18, something very fascinating. I'll read it again. Everyone, this is them speaking to each other. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. They then called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And later in verse 21, it says, after further threats, they let them go. So we see here in the passage that the Jewish leaders can't actually deny the miracle. They acknowledge the miracle, but they actually intend to suppress Peter and John by commanding them to no longer speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But look at Peter and John's response in verse 19. Which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. And this story reminds me of a moment at the football. As again, you, you heard me say last week, I'm a diehard Carlton man. and one of my very best friends in the world. We met the first day of school as five-year-olds. We've had this rivalry of his team versus my team. His team, sorry. And about seven years ago, we went to the football and my team was up by 35 points and managed to hold on and win by one solitary point. And my reaction to this was actually running down the aisle to the left and high-fiving strangers, running down the aisle to the right and high-fiving strangers, high-fiving strangers in the aisle in front of me and high-fiving strangers in the aisle behind me. My response was that of a proclamation, a joy that what, of what had just transpired. My friend and his friend who went for the same team were just sitting there sulking and just suppressed. They didn't want to think about what had just happened and what they'd witnessed. In my example, it's so simple, but I wasn't going to suppress what I'd seen and heard because of what my friends had thought or what they wanted to see. See, Peter and John just decided to proclaim what they had seen and heard about Jesus. And they weren't going to suppress it just because the Jewish leaders didn't want them to. They placed what God desires over what the Jewish leaders desired. And the question for us is, are we going to proclaim truth of what we know about Jesus, or are we going to suppress that truth just because of what others may think about us? See, the disciples are talking about something far more valuable than a football match. They were talking about the truth of the Messiah, that he had come, he had died, he had rose again. 
it's such a powerful story and a reality that they were living in as the early church. And they understood they had a mandate to continue the movement of the gospel outwards. I wonder what impact we as Christians and as the church would have if we actually consistently put the concerns of God before the concerns of man. There's also another response that we see in the back end of chapter 4 of Peter and John. Will you read with me uh, verse 23 to 30? On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported that the chief priests, uh, all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. You would think after being jailed and commanded not to preach or teach in the name of Jesus, they may be a bit jaded, discouraged, they don't want a bar of it. But actually their response is the opposite. They go back and share with their fellow believers all that's happened. And their response is that to actually pray together. They sought God together. They ask for boldness and for God to heal and to perform signs and wonders. Their prayer isn't for protection. Their prayer isn't for comfort. Their prayer isn't for self-preservation. Their prayer is actually for God to enable them to continue His work and His mission. It's so obvious that in the early church there's a, a true hunger for the Word to go out and there's a real faith that God is actually active and working. Not only that, there is a desire to see miracles, signs and wonders, and they openly ask for that. The prayer isn't for the sake of themselves, but it's for the sake of reaching others. And I wonder if we as a collective, as the global church at large, pray for boldness and miracles enough. And sometimes I think that we base our response to opposition on an assumption of what God's response might be. You know, I'm reminded that Sometimes we've got to be more childlike in our requests to God. When you're a kid and you have no way to pay for things and you want that toy or you want that treat, you just go to your parents and you ask, can I have this, can I have this, can I have this, can I have this, can I have this? And the answer may be no, 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 no. But there is still this desire to come and ask from a provider. And I think we need to kind of recall that when it comes to our faith, that God is a true Father that we can come and present our requests to. And interestingly, there's a third response I want to pick up from this passage in verse 31 about this. It says, After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. See, not only did Peter and John respond to the opposition by turning to God, but God responds to them. God answers their prayers. They're granted boldness. The Holy Spirit is um, equipping them. And we actually see in Acts 5, verse 12 to 16, a bit of a spoiler alert, a couple of different things in response to this. See, it says that the apostles perform many signs and wonders among the people in verse 12. And then God continues to add more to their number. And it says this in verse 15. Listen to this. This is wild. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. God truly answered their prayers. See, I think sometimes we base our responses on an assumption that God won't respond, but He does and He will. Do you trust that God is actually actively equipping you to deal with opposition and trial? If not, take heart from this passage and this teaching. We see it here in plain sight. Upon preparing this message, I was wondering, what was the motivating factor for the apostles? Jesus has already died and and left. He promises his Holy Spirit and they're, they're empowered. But what is the motivating driver? 
And it's a different response. It's actually a response to what's called the Great Commission. See, after Jesus had died and rose again, he appeared to his disciples in many different ways. And one of them is found in the book of Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20. And it says this, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. See, the book of Acts focus, focuses on the work of the apostles, which is to fulfill this great commission. See, Jesus not only spoke to them in that time and in that context, but his great commission is actually for all of us, for you and for I to fulfill this mandate of going and making disciples. The imperative is actually on us. We don't sit back and hopefully hope that our neighbor comes and asks us about Jesus, but we actually have an active role to play in fulfilling this commission. And like Peter and John, we need to take on the commission despite opposition. So the responses we see today, Peter and John, despite the opposition, proclaim the truth about what they've seen and heard about Jesus. They come together and pray to God, asking for boldness, that he would equip them, that he would perform miracles and provide them with all they need. The third one is that we've also seen God's response, is that he fulfills his promise to equip them and he goes ahead and gives them the Holy Spirit. So it leads me to want to pray for two camps today. You may be a Christian and you kind of hear this and you're inspired and you want to actually take on that great commission for yourself with renewed boldness, with renewed faith. I want to pray for you today. The second one is you may be like the Jewish leaders. You may have seen Jesus work, but you kind of suppressed it, but you can't deny it anymore. And you may want to commit your life to Jesus. In just a moment, a button's going to go on your screen and you can actually respond to that and it'll take you to a leader who actually loved to pray with you and talk to you about that decision. So while you're thinking about that, I'd love to pray for the first group of people. If you would bow your head and close your eyes. Lord, I just thank you so much that you have given us a commission to go and make disciples. Thank you so much that you invite us into your purposes, that you are actually empowering us through your spirit to have the gospel move to the very ends of the earth, including the city of Melbourne and the communities that we live in. Help us, Lord, to have boldness. Help us to trust that you're with us and trust that you're actively at work and that you're never going to leave us or forsake us in that fulfillment of the commission. Thank you, God, for what you're doing, God. Help us this week. Give us opportunities to actually step out in boldness and share our faith, what we have seen and heard about you and your son, Jesus. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're that second person today and you want to commit your life to Jesus, I'd love to pray with you. Would you bow your head and close your eyes as well? Lord, we thank you so much that through your son we can have a relationship with you. We thank you so much that by your death on the cross you have atoned for our sin and then we can actually walk with you day by day you as our God and our Father, and us as your children. Lord, we just commit our lives to you today and say, have your way in us. Help us to take on your mission, even as new believers, because we've seen and we've heard about your goodness. We thank you for what you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for tuning into this message, Church. Looking forward to seeing you again soon. Bless you. Well, hey, everybody, I don't know about you, but I have had an exceptional time worshiping with you, praying with you, engaging in God's word with you this morning. Wasn't Pastor Dan's word just outstanding? My goodness, I can't wait to see and hear what God wants to share with us next week. But you know what? You don't have to wait. I said at the start of this service that in James chapter four, it says this, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. I want to encourage you, don't wait for every Sunday to jump online to be a part of a service like this in order to engage with God's word and to engage with his spirit and to engage with what it is that he wants to do in you and through you because remember you are the church we are the church and whenever somebody encounters you whether it be through a phone call or 
a Zoom call or maybe just a wave as you walk at a safe distance past someone down the street. Amen. Whether it be going to get a haircut. See that? I got a haircut this week. That's why I'm not wearing a hat. Forgot to mention that in the updates. But here's the thing. When I was sitting in that chair, I realized in that moment, hey, I am the church. And I the experience that I give my, uh, my barber is actually giving him an experience of the church. And so I wanted to bless him. You know what I'm saying? You're picking up what I'm putting down, church. Well, hey, I want to encourage you this week to remember that you are the church wherever you are. So continue to be it in the way that you are it already. You're phenomenal. I've already said it. I love you. I'm so proud to be the leader of such a phenomenal, outstanding group of people. Let's continue to believe that God is going to grow this community. I want to encourage you this morning, if you need prayer, hit that request prayer button. Do it now. If you've not responded to the invitation to know Jesus personally, hey, why don't you commit your life to Jesus right now? Now is the time. I want to encourage you to do that. Do it. It'll be the best decision, I guarantee you. Not the easiest, but it'll be the best decision of your life. And we want to walk that journey with you. So if you're joining us this morning, you have not said yes to Jesus. Let's do it now. Hey, there's plenty of opportunities for you to connect with us and to connect with Jesus throughout the week. Um, jump online to our website, steeplechurch.com.au. Connect with us that way. Jump online every week. You are so welcome to continue joining us each week to worship and to engage with God's word and pray with us. Also, you can connect with us and support some of our initiatives. Support the Steeple Coffee Initiative by jumping on to steeple.coffee, hitting that grocery tab and continuing to support the work that we're doing there with our great friends at Servants Community Housing Church. If you want to just reach out and say hello, tell us what God's up to in your life. Remember prayer and praise uh, at steeplechurch.com.au. Reach out, tell us what God is doing in your life. Uh, tell us how we can be praying for you, but also share in praising um, Him with us because He is a good God. He is faithful. I want to encourage you, church. You are awesome. Keep being you. Bless you. Have a great week. Steeple kids, hi Steeple families. My name is Caroline and I'm here to continue with you our series in the book of Acts. So today's story comes from Acts chapter 3 and there are three characters in our story today. There's Peter and John and a poor man who couldn't walk. Let's begin. Peter and John were going into the temple to pray. And at the same time, there was a poor man who was carried to the temple by his friends. Now the reason he was carried to the temple is because he couldn't walk, his legs didn't work. Maybe you've seen somebody who couldn't walk before. Maybe you've seen somebody in a wheelchair. That's kind of the same thing. So every day, this man would sit at the front of the temple and he would ask people for money as they were going in. So as Peter and John were going inside, he asked them for some money. Now, do you remember what we learned last week about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit helps us live as God's people? Well, we're about to see the Holy Spirit in action through Peter and John. Let's keep going. So Peter and John looked straight at this man, and Peter said, Look at us. I don't have any silver or gold that I can give you, but what I do have, I will give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. Then they helped him up, and his legs were instantly healed. He could walk. Then the man started jumping and thanking God. He was so happy. And he went inside the temple with Peter and John. And everybody who was around were amazed at what God did when they saw that the man was healed. So at the beginning of this story, this man was only hoping to get some money from Peter and John. But Peter and John didn't have any money to give him but they did give him what they had, and that was even better. So just like Peter and John, we can share with others what God gives us. Maybe this week 
you'd like to think of something that you can give to somebody else. Maybe you can give someone a hug. Maybe you can draw them a picture or tell them I love you. Maybe you can even pray for somebody who really needs it. Have a think about something that you would like to give to someone this week and I'll see you soon.